Welcome to Seaside Sermons. My name is Bert Allen. Today, let's learn about making strong friendships in Christ. I wrote a book about that. You can find it for free as a PDF download at ChristAssembly.org. But today, let's start 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and learn about these great strong friendships that people can have in Jesus Christ. Verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. So we've got three guys there, and I want to emphasize the importance of ministry teams today. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy all had a relationship with the people at Thessalonica, and we're going to do a quick study on two of those guys, Silvanus and Timothy. Silvanus is a Roman form of the word Silas. I do not have a verse in the Bible that says Silvanus equals Silas, but a lot of verses point to the fact that Timothy and Silas and Paul visited Thessalonica together, and there's no Silvanus mentioned except Silas. So in my mind, the evidence points towards Silvanus being the same guy as Silas. So let's start with him. You might recall that Silas came from Jerusalem. So I'm going to turn back to the book of Acts and pick up a little bit there about Silas, that he's going to be one of the guys to go. So I'm in Acts chapter 15, verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So in Acts 15, a dispute had arose in Antioch about whether you have to keep the law or not. So Paul and Barnabas violently argued, not physically violent, but with tremendous force argued against keeping the law, that salvation is by faith. So that dispute simmered and then boiled over, and they sent the guys down to Jerusalem to talk to the elders, the congregation, and especially the apostles. They have a meeting, they get a letter, they come back. So Paul and Barnabas went from Antioch to Jerusalem, had the Jerusalem council with everybody, got a letter of instructions about the best way of handling the matter from the people in Jerusalem, and now they're heading back to Antioch. But the guys in Jerusalem said, let's send the two guys with you, Barsabbas and, and Silas, because they're both men that are highly thought of at Jerusalem and they can be a verbal mouthpiece for all the people in Jerusalem that will accompany the letter. So people can understand from them the discussion that was had and the ideas that were given by God back in uh, Jerusalem about what to do with keeping the law or not out in Antioch. In Antioch, a whole bunch of Gentiles had come into the church, and the question arose, hey, do they have to keep the law or just the Jews or neither of us? And the answer came back, uh, no, we don't have to keep the law. Uh, salvation is by faith. But notice the verse I read in Acts 15, 22 said that Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among their brethren, accompanied Paul back up there to Antioch. So he was a temporary visitor that went up to Antioch so that he could explain the Jerusalem Council ruling to the people at Antioch and the church. So then the next time we read about him, is that they go on a missionary journey together. They had a strong disagreement about taking John Mark with them, who left them on the first missionary journey. So they couldn't get along, you know, and Paul says, okay, I'll take Silas, and he goes off on a missionary journey. And Barnabas takes John Mark, and they go back to Cyprus, where the first missionary journey started, and that's also where Barnabas was from. He was a Cypriot, of Levi, he was a Levite, uh, from Cyprus, that's where he first comes, and you meet her about him in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, where he sold all his possessions and gave them to the apostles. But we're getting a little background here. The background point I want to make is, in Jerusalem, Silas was chosen to go up to Antioch. Then in Antioch, Paul chose him to go out on a missionary journey with him, so Paul and Silas started traveling. As they started traveling, they went over to Philippi. And you might remember at Philippi, they were arrested. And that's in Macedonia, not that far from Thessalonica, which is also in Macedonia. But at midnight, it's worth noting what Paul and Barnabas, excuse me, Paul and Silas were doing in the jail at Philippi. 
and it says in verse, this is Acts 16, 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And then, you know, great things happened, and eventually they got out of there. But the point I want to make is about Silas. Paul and Silas were at Philippi in jail together singing hymns. Do you want to talk about strong friendship in Christ? Try being in jail at midnight singing so loudly that all, singing hymns of praise so loudly at midnight in jail that all the other prisoners can hear you at midnight. Okay, but that's Acts 15, 22 to provide a little more background on Silas. So now you're sitting there going, okay, well, do we have anything from, uh, anything directly from Thessalonica about what's going on? Yes. Paul gets to Thessalonica with Silas in Acts chapter 17. And in verse 4 it says, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. So I know something else about Silas. I know Silas and Paul had left Philippi, gone next to Thessalonica, and Paul's custom was to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath and proclaim Christ. They got mad. The Jews got very irate with Paul when he did that at Thessalonica, and eventually they'll chase them all over the place. But Silas was right there with them. Just like Barnabas took John Mark, Paul took Silas into the ministry. You know, in our lives, we should always be on the lookout for men that we can take into the ministry to join us. And women can take women. But we can have other people that we reach out and grab and say, come on, let's go with me to the ministry. And Paul did that for Silas. So, therefore, we know in Acts 17, 4, here's the point, that both Paul and Silas had visited Thessalonica together, which leads further to the conclusion that Silvanus in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, that Silvanus matches up with Silas because Paul was with Silas at Thessalonica. Well, that's a little bit of background there about him. Little background on Timothy. Timothy's far more known in the New Testament than Silas. Timothy has two whole books that Paul wrote to him, first and second Timothy. And it's about a father, Paul, writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, and explaining to him how to set up elders, how to set up deacons, how to plant churches, and how to make things go great. But here's how they met. So over there in Acts 16, verse 1, Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So that's how he met him. And Paul said, I want to take Timothy with me into the ministry. And therefore, we know that Timothy was joining him. But if we go back now a little, if we go forward a little, after Paul leaves Thessalonica, he's driven out of there by the Jews and he goes to Berea. And when he gets to Berea, the Jews from Thessalonica come on over and try to, and try to persecute him some more. So in Acts chapter 17, when the Thessalonian Jews arrive in Berea to chase Paul and Silas that have moved on out of Thessalonica and over to Berea, the Bereans, by the way, are known for their more noble-minded ways because they searched the scriptures to find out if Paul and Silas were telling them the truth, and they found out, yes, you are. From the scriptures, we agree that Christ is really Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus of Nazareth is Christ. But the guys from Thessalonica chase them on over there to Berea, and we read this. This is also important, and now we're going to link up everybody at Berea on that same missionary journey. We're going to link up Paul and Silas and Timothy. So in chapter 17 of Acts, it says, verse 14, Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the, the sea. And Silas and Timothy remained there. So the brethren at Berea said, You know the Thessalonian Jews are just causing too much trouble for you and they want to kill you. So why don't you leave Berea and go down to Athens? And Paul said, okay, but he left behind Timothy and Silas. So now we have a pretty good idea of the three players here. We have Paul the Apostle, then we have Silvanus that went on that missionary journey 
also known as Silas, in my mind. The evidence is not airtight, but it sure makes a lot of sense to me because we've read about that relationship he had with everybody at Thessalonica. And Timothy, we know for sure, same Timothy, because we read about him there too. On the same missionary journey, we catch him at Berea, but he was obviously present also at Thessalonica. But I want to make a bigger point. Here's what we really ought to focus on. Are you part of a ministry team today? Do you have friends that are in ministry? Is there anybody in your life that's reached out and grabbed you and brought you into ministry? We are all daily ministers for Christ, and that means that we use our spiritual gifts every day, even if we work a full-time job outside the home, inside the home, raising children, whatever we're doing, wherever we're doing it. We are going to be daily ministers for Christ. We have laid down our life and denied ourselves, and we're picking up our cross and following Jesus wherever he leads us every day. But we don't do that alone. We do that with Paul and Timothy and Silas. We form these ministry teams. And notice how Paul reaches out to these guys, like Timothy, meets Timothy at Lystra Derby and takes them to be with him. Meet Silas there at Antioch, says, I want you to come with me on the next ministry I do as we travel around. Are you reaching out to disciple men and women in your life? Are you reaching out to do that? Are you bringing people with you into the ministry that you do, whatever it may be? Are you training those folks all the time? You know, it's so important that we're building our spiritual lives in the name of Jesus, that we're making learners. Yeah, I can call them disciples at times, but that's another one of those Latin terms that I don't really care for. I would much rather that we use English terms or Greek terms. So we could call them math a taste kind of people, but we don't really want to do that. We'd rather just call them learners. So why don't we call them learners, the people that others will call disciples? They're learners from Christ. It's descriptive. It describes those men. But these men were learners with Paul, and they became great friends. But we're going to see that that ministry team of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy have this great friendship with the people at Thessalonica, and we'll keep reading about that. But we've done a little background today, and I want to emphasize to you that if you're not part of a ministry team and your local fellowship, make one or join one, but get one going. Don't go it alone in your Christianity. Be a part of a ministry team like they were. Get some folks together. Minister together. Walk together in Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us and the power and love that you give to us every day in our lives. May we share that love with others, Lord, and may we love you with all of our heart and love you more and more. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Before I close the video, I'd like to share with you four verses about eternal life. I often ask people this simple question. Why should Jesus let you into heaven? And the answer to that question surprises many people because it comes from the Bible and it's simple and it's clear. Most folks, when they hear that question, they tell me, well, I've been good or tried to do more good than bad or I tried hard or I've done a lot of nice things and I hope God will let me into heaven. They somehow think if their good works outweigh their bad works that God will let them in. But God says, actually, I'll let people into heaven because of a free gift. But the story from Jesus starts with four verses, and I'm going to read them one at a time. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 You see, for every person who lives today on earth in human flesh, we've all sinned, every one of us. We've all told a lie. We've all done or said something that made somebody else angry and we were doing it out of anger ourselves. We've all done things to hurt other people at one time or another. God says that's all sin and I look upon that as falling short of my glory, God says. God says we should never fall short of his standard, which is the glory of God. Well, is it serious that we've sinned? Should I be worried about that? Everybody sinned. Why should I worry? Well, consider Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, that all of us deserve the death penalty. 
At the moment we sin, we incur the death penalty for the smallest sin or the biggest sin. I'm happy that Romans 3, 20, 6, 23 continues and says, But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, if you've been listening carefully and thinking about what the Bible says, so far we've learned that we're all sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we all deserve the death penalty. This doesn't sound like good news until you read the last part of that last verse. It says that God has a free gift for all of us. It's in Christ Jesus our Lord, and it's eternal life. The free gift of eternal life that only Jesus Christ can give you. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Why would God offer us this great gift if we're all sinners? Well, Romans 5, 8 tells us. It says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He died in our place. God loves sinners like you and like me. He died in my place and in your place. He paid the death penalty for me. I often illustrate the free gift like this. That I have this old Nissan truck. It has 285,000 miles on it. It's not that great a truck. It sits at the beach every day. But I illustrate the point this way. I hold up the keys to my truck and I say, I'm going to make you a symbolic gift of my truck. But until you take the keys out of my hand, it's not your truck yet. Well, let me tell you what I mean. A lot of people have been going to church for years. They know all about Jesus. They can quote verses about Jesus. But they know in their heart that they're not quite right with God. And there's never been a day in their life where they've been born again and they know it. You see, they're just staring at the keys in God's hand and he's offering you the free gift today of saying, reach out by faith and receive that free gift and take it into your heart today. Receive the free gift. Okay, how do we do that? Well, Romans 10.9 tells us how to do that. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he means saved from the death penalty, eternal destruction. So we can receive that free gift right now by faith, and we can pray a prayer together. I urge you to pray with me. I'm going to pray it right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I confess that I am a sinner and I fall short of the glory of God. I confess, too, that I deserve the wages of sin, which is death. But, Lord, you offer me the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I accept that free gift right now. I believe that you love me and that God died on the cross for me, that Jesus Christ is God, and he died on the cross for me. You paid the death penalty for me, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I repent of my sins, and I accept that free gift, Lord. Thank you so much that you have forgiven me. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I'd love you to send me an email and we'll rejoice together. Send me the email at friend at christassembly.org. That's friend at christassembly.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Hallelujah. Scripture quotations taken from the NASB, New American Standard Bible, 
Copyright 1995 by the Lockman Foundation. Used by permission, all rights reserved.